so much. Body system. It's all right. It's so cool. Listen, yeah. skip, skip. Let, let, let's hope that the next destruction one comes and then somebody will catch it. Your savior's won't be able to say, oh man, I True. feel bad. I feel bad for you, King. Blackjack had to do with the same thing. Two guys ganging up. You had to pile on of that shit? Oh. You made me think of some history. I know. I know. Built in heat. Oh, it's just worth two. All right, gents. This question may seem familiar because it's just a rehash of a previous question. From a historical perspective, who is the undisputed face of Monday Night Raw? One, two, three, four. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold. Chris Jericho. Jericho. Rock. Scene. Get ready, prepare that argument. Because right. you didn't sound excited, but I know no, this is, you have it. Right. You have the way to argue about it. All right, Stone Cold Steve Austin. The Monday Night Wars were going to Nitro until Stone Cold Steve Austin began his meteoric rise to the top. Not only was Stone Cold the face of pro wrestling in the Attitude Era, he changed what wrestling was sure. to a more edgy, hardcore product. Stone Cold did everything imaginable. Your, mo your top moments from Monday Night Raw, Stone Cold in the beer truck, Stone Cold helping Foley win the title, Stone Cold in the rock. You could go on for days. Um, Stone Cold is just the Man, it, he, he embodies that era in one human being. That's a good argument. Stone Cold paved the way for Monday Night Raw, but Raw is Jericho. The guy came in, he was just as edgy, he was just as raunchy. He's calling the boss's daughter a uh, trash bag hoe, putting on cal caliber matches. First ever undisputed champion. He topped Triple H, Stone Cold, and The Rock all in one night in the tournament. And he's been doing it for decades. You know, Austin hung up the towel, and he's doing his podcast. Jericho is doing it on Raw up until recently and in New Japan, coming back for the Royal Rumble, and he still stayed fresh for all this time. So on the longevity of it, Chris Jericho is going to go down his face. All right. Raw. That's a great argument. First take. You got The Rock also leading in the, uh, the uh, whole Attitude Era and the Monday Night Wars. <clears throat> Without The Rock, Stone Cold would have been nowhere because their rivalry pretty much made that whole era. Um, you had him go up against Chris Jericho. You had The Rock basically just putting in work, making it making it happen. And not only that, just taking what he learned there and then transforming it into his, his now acting career and still coming back to, to feed the, the Raw and WWE brand. Stone Cold Barrett. Let's hear the argument. Seen for it the face of Raw, right? Undisputed face of Raw. Everybody knows what. The Raw is the main show. Cena. Cena's the man. He had a he had a match with almost every great wrestler that ever is on Raw. Out of it, every wrestler, well, what is it, the pay-per-views. But let's talk about just Raw. He's the face. Everybody comes to him. Half of them come to him. Half of them come to hate him. Everybody knows that he's the guy that if there's a new guy coming up, who they got to face? They got to go against the gatekeeper, Cena. Cena's always been there, been a cement in that company. He's... Next to Undertaker, he's a guy that always did the right thing for the business, and he stayed as the face. That was, that was, that was an excellent argument. I think for me, uh, uh, we're either talking about the legacy of Stone Cold, which the Attitude Era Raw was centered around him, not The Rock, and The Rock did not make Austin. Awesome. So that the one to say, you he helped to make that era. Yeah, you took a cheap shot at Austin using The Rock. Um, ah. Uh, so I buzzed in first. <laughs> well, <laughs> this, just because you're the beneficiary of buzzing in first and Kenny Austin, that was a great compelling <laughs> scene <laughs> argument. The only reason why I'm not going to award you that question is had you said Cena carried Raw longer, because think if you think of Austin's career window, it hasn't been as long as Cena's on WWE. So if you had said Cena put it on his back and carried it longer, I would have 100% given you it based on the rest of your argument. But it will go to the man who buzzed in first and took the easy answer. Hell yeah. Okay, how do you want to spend your two? Uh, one eliminator. Along with the king. King, thanks for being on the show. Stick around after the show. I have uh, some great developments to share with you. I'm going to make it interesting. Turn heel. Don't one do eliminator. It. All right, so what do you want to do? You want to yeah. You're gonna save. 
So the table right now is the sign that runs the pound with three. It's a word. <laughs> it is not a word. Three for the sign that runs the pound. Two save tokens for the SRG boss, and you're just sitting pretty there with one eliminator. First take. All right. Let's get to your next trivia question. It's I held the belt longer than anyone else. I will name a championship. You must tell me the name of the man who held that title longer than anyone else. Not in a single reign, but in a total Ooh. number of days reign. Multiple, <laughs> multiple reign? Doesn't matter. As long as days Combined added days. Up. Okay. Right. Okay. Number one. The ECW Championship. Robin Dam? Incorrect. Robin Dam only held the title for 21 days. Rhino. Incorrect. Tommy Dreamer. Tommy Dreamer is incorrect. The franchise Shane Douglas. Damn. Everyone forgets Shane Douglas. Question number two. The Ring of Honor World Championship. Who held that title longer than anyone else? Um, <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Yes? CM Punk. Incorrect. Thanks, um, Daniel Bryan. Incorrect. Just throw something out. Um, I'll go to the ring. Held the ring of honor. Uh, how about Samoa Joe? Damn. God, I was damn. trying to think. All right. Number three. The NWA World Heavyweight Rest. With Flair. Incorrect. Ooh. Not Flair. Good. Dusty Rhodes. Incorrect. Luthez. It's called the Luthez Press for a reason. Question number four. The WWE Champion Rest. Awesome. Incorrect. Bruno San Martino. Bruno San Martino. Four billion yeah. days. <laughs> how would you like to spend this? I get um, one? There's just one. <laughs> it's the only question in the category that was answered. Gotta get one more less, yo. First take, you are one token away from elimination. <laughs> Hang in there. All right. No, I'm happy I eliminated. Your next <laughs> quick fire question. Oh, I hate this. Yeah. Let's, uh, you've uh, won the most uh, of them. You uh, st Stone Cold, uh, light beer, and uh, <laughs> light beer. <laughs> no, two. This one's worth two. Shoot it over. Nice. What is the most underrated WrestleMania match ever? Hmm. Underrated. Buzz in to get your priority in answering. Edge vs. Undertaker. Edge vs. Undertaker, WrestleMania 24 in the main event. It's difficult when you can't pick the obvious answer because there's no obvious answer here. I'm going to go to the ladder match. The multi-man intercontinental title ladder match? Okay. I'm almost <laughs> certain you picked it because that's the only one you can remember, but I remember it. Right now, yeah. Angle Benoit. WrestleMania 17. Okay. Angle Benoit, WrestleMania 17. So starting with Mr. Rest. When we're talking about underrated. We're talking about things that people wouldn't bring up in the everyday conversation. I want you to go back. I want you to watch Ed vs. Undertaker, where he has the edge heads in this corner making it a three-on-one match, and how many false finishes that match had, and how epic the psychology was between the two of them. That me, for a second, I thought the Undertaker was going to actually lose this match uh, straight up to Edge, and I remember jumping up out of my seat on several occasions and literally being blown away by the edge of that match. I was watching in Florida. The power went out for like 30 seconds. I thought I was going to die. Um, and just the back and forth. You know, Edge almost made him tap out, which would have been crazy. You know, he hit him with everything he had in his arsenal. The Undertaker just kept coming, kicking out. But there was a good, you know, minute and a half period where you thought the streak was ending okay. to, to Edge. He was that hot at that time. Excellent argument. 
Angle and Benoit was a match that not only was a great match, it started the beginning of a trend in WWE. It was one of the first matches where people started to realize what we could have with these amazing wrestlers just going in there and tearing the house down with amazing wrestling. That match almost had no build. The, the actual outcome was Kurt Angle coming out and saying, hey, we have no match for WrestleMania. Let's have a match. And that match had brawling. It had technical wrestling. And they put on a clinic that night, and people don't talk about it that much, obviously. Because they can. Benoit, because they can't. And that match, it, it started the beginning of, hey, Brock Lesnar, Edge, Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, giving these guys the credit that they didn't deserve. And a lot of the focus moving away from ladders and, and, and lightning and pyro effects and getting back to what was being done in the ring. Okay. What I liked about the ladder match is uh, it was a match that was kind of unpredictable because no one could really know or tell who was going to win. And the fact that out of nowhere, Zack Ryder won, it was like a combination of like him always just kind of being the underdog and finally getting his like five seconds of fame. So like the pop that once like he pushed the Miz off and then he took the belt, like the pop in that day was like tremendous. It was so underrated just because no one really knew what the outcome was going to be. And then for Zack Ryder to come out on top was like icing on the cake. Okay. Well, one argument completely won me over based on how it was booked and the quality that was given that match. And that was Steve Ref's argument mm -hmm. about Edge and Taker. So how would you like to spend your two winnings in this melee? Take you out and me and Chris. Oh! One on one once again. Sir, yes, first sir. take, thanks for being here. We are down to our final two. Let's get into the next trivia. And due to the magic of movie editing, we have now seamlessly transitioned the sound that runs the pound, Chris Guardino. We should do a dawn when the lights out. Come on. Okay. So, yeah, so you want to be the ethereal undertaker of Melee? Sure, why not? As we stand in this rumble, we have the man who entered in at number two and has been in this entire rumble, Steve Ress, sitting pretty with two, three, two, three, I can't see. They blend together. Three escape tokens and the sound that runs the pound with two escape tokens. Guys, you gotta start attacking each other. And so your next trivia category, Mr. Kennedy! An entire category Yikes. of Mr. Kennedy. <laughs> Damn, All right. Now, remember, you have your tokens, but remember the rules and how they stand. Mm -hmm. If one of you, doesn't have to be this category, if one of you gets a, queen, a clean sweep on a trivia category, you automatically eliminate someone at the table. Okay. Question number one. What is the only WWE championship won by Mr. Kennedy? Gordino? Tag team. Incorrect. United States Championship. The United States Championship is correct. Since you have three saves, that automatically applies an eliminator. And now you've dwindled them down to one. Question number two. What town does Mr. Kennedy... Green Bay, Wisconsin. Green Bay, Wisconsin is correct. Thank you, sir. I hate Mr. Kennedy. Which wrestler did Kennedy defeat in a match and be thrown as the Raw general manager? He beat this man and then got this man fired as Raw GM. Find the storyline. Ten, nine, eight. William Regal? Is correct. Holy yeah. shit! Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to attack his tokens or stock up on some I'm, I'm taking a save, baby. Okay. All right, so the last question. What faction did the now Mr. Anderson join in TNA? Aces and eights. Aces and eights is correct. I assume you... Yeah, I'll take a save. So that round wasn't bad. You, you broke even. Okay. Well, you guys are going to like the next question, but let's see what it's worth. Ooh. Now an eliminator... <laughs> a destruction power ball here intense. automatically triggers the winner of this match. That's good booking. That is good booking. Nope, just worth two. Okay, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good booking, but thank God. Numbers and stuff over there. They do. Your question is 
which wrestler is WWE missing an opportunity on by not pushing them enough? <laughs> Somebody better buzz in and like say, oh, this is my answer. So who are you going to go with? Finn Balor. Finn Balor, and you are going to choose... Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler. There's a lot of guys you could say that they're not pushing enough. Rusev, Ziggler, the list goes on and on. But Finn Balor is someone they're not pushing enough who could be a face of the company, who could be a main eventer, multi-time world champion. This is a guy who's traveled the world, not just been in WWE. He's traveled the world, New Japan, all over the place, and shown that he is a top-level competitor. His demon gimmick is something that kids would eat up. People flicking through the channels would stop and see that and go, oh, wow, I want to watch this guy. And Finn Balor is just a fantastic wrestler. If they let him not be cheesy Mr. Babyface, and he's also okay. fantastic on the mic. All right. Finn Balor got his push, first ever Universal Champion. Dolph Ziggler has not gotten his push, and he's proven time and time again that he has the athleticism, the, char the charisma, and the in-ring talent of some of the greatest wrestlers that ever lived. It's not too much of a stretch to compare him to Shawn Michaels. He's got it. If they give him the reins and let him run with it, that's somebody who they're missing out on. And I know that if they let Dolph Ziggler walk and he goes to a Ring of Honor and he go or he goes to a New Japan Pro Wrestling, WWE is going to be really sorry, even more so than the likes of Cody Rhodes, because Cody Rhodes is not as athletically gifted as Dolph Ziggler is. As am I. That, could, that hurt my soul. Man, this is a really, this is a really difficult question to answer because they're both right. So I have to pick it. But it's so if you had the intensity, if you had the integrity of, of Ziggler's actual career, so it comes down to the intelligence of the argument. I know, right? You judge on the three eyes. So, oh man. <sighs> While I do agree I know I could flip a coin on this. I agree with both of you. Um, I'll say this. The huge opportunity, because the question was preference, a huge opportunity. I think if you're going by that, then you have to take the wrestler could have been more money and because Finn has the advantage of coming from a place where he proved himself coming with like basically riding a wave in the WWE is how you're going to win this one because I think if I just keep it at the heart of the question the huge opportunity aspect you win this question on semantics so congratulations how do you I agree <laughs> how do you want to spend your winnings I'll give two over there alright cool all right, so the new next trivia category is tag team managers. And the first one up, number one, the Midnight Express. <sighs> I guess. Somebody wants to buzz I almost in. know what's wrong. Tennessee Lee. Tennessee Lee is incorrect. No, no, no. You don't need to buzz in. You can just give your answer. No clue. Lou Albano. Jim Cornette. Ah. Okay, all right. Well, Question number two: The Road Warriors. Steve Ross. Damn. Oh. This hurts. Blackjack's over here having. Trouble. I'm gonna pass because I don't want to give him a hint. Okay. Mr. Fuji. Mm -hmm. right. The guy from NXT. Yeah. The answer was Precious Paul Ellering. Yes, yep. from NXT. Paul Ellering. Yep. With the authors of pain. Question number three. ECW's Impact Players, the team of Lance Storm and Just Incredible. See the rest? Dawn Marie. Dawn Marie is wow. correct. How would you like to spend your winnings? How many has he got there? He's got two. two. All right, let's even up the score. Oh, one apiece. Your last one, Eminem. Wow. Rest? Molina. How do you want to spend that? Now you're oh, in. Wait, no, yeah. Take it. That was, now you're that was in. a bad move, man. Take it. Now you're in the danger zone. All in right. the danger zone. All oh, right. fuck, it's a debate again. Let's, yeah, we're back to debate. <laughs> <laughs> if, he, if I pull up an orange one, you <laughs> get your butt. Yeah, that's why. WWE questions, damn it. Nope, two. Crap. 
He's hoping somebody gets eliminated off this damn thing. On the ropes. All right. Your question is, what is the lamest entrance music in WWE history? Zack Ryder's. <laughs> oh, you buzzed him, but okay. Uh, Santino. Zack Ryder's music could work but it just doesn't you know it, it's trying to capture like a cheap boy band sing along in the car type thing and it's just it's not a good song the lyrics aren't there and i think it's it's hurt him on his career more than anything because it's really just not that catchy it's very bland it's not upbeat i'm i'm really not sure where they were going with that at all okay santino i actually think zach Ryder's music fits him perfectly but santino's music was weird it was corny and Towards the end, no one even liked Santino, and no one really liked hearing his music. That oh, so God, it's I time like to change Santino. the channel. Well, towards the end, there. Oh, so then, what am I? You like Santino, so then I'm screwed. No, it's not that I love. But Santino's Santino. music sucked okay. as well as Santino. So his music could have been, you know, a little rock and roll or. As someone who doesn't have the most athletic build, I would have happily taken a Santino career where I could make money and make people laugh. So I would have happily taken that. But, I mean, he just he just had, like, pseudo-joke opera music, whereas mm-hmm. the crappy boy band music was really, really bad. I got nothing on this. All right. Two tokens. How do you want to spend them? <laughs> He's trying to make a decision. I'm going to take one and give him one. Your next trivia category, wrestlers of the 70s. Woo. <laughs> Question number one, what was the finishing move of superstar Billy Graham? Top rope splash. Incorrect. Uh, super slam. Bear hug. <sighs> what Deadly. a lame. Question number, hey, back. Question number two, which wrestler played okay, for the you? San Diego Chargers and was the first man to be inducted in both the WCW and WWF Hall of Fame? Bam Bam Bigelow. Incorrect. Tully Blanchard. Lad. I've never, heard, right. <laughs> never heard his name before. The cat. You mean Ernest the Cat Miller? Uh, how, at we some both point, lose for that. At some point, <laughs> I just need to book myself to the title match. Jesus Christ. All right, question number three. Okay. New Japan Pro was founded in 1972 by which Japanese legend? Antonio Inoki? Correct. And how would you like to... I'm stuck with this, right? You're stuck with it. I'll take a save. Okay. All right. Your final question. Who became the first man to compete under a mask at MSG in 1972? Dos Caras? Incorrect. Pedro Morales? And uh, Mil Mascaras. Pedro Morales. I keep going with Pedro Morales. Mil, Mil Dos is his son. And uh, Bam Mascaras, I believe, I don't quote me, but I believe he's like Del Rio's uncle. Right? I was going to say. Why he inducted him. Yeah, yeah. All right. Gentlemen, the next Powerball is worth. Uh oh, four. So that's it. If you win this, you win. If you win this, you can get him with two tokens if you just apply all four on him. Okay. Okay, from a storytelling standpoint, what is Mick Foley's greatest career feud? Triple H. The Undertaker. Okay. Mick Foley fought Triple H toward the end of his career when Triple H was on his rise up. Mick Foley gave everything that he had to try and defeat the young hungry line and he just couldn't do it and he was beaten and destroyed by Triple H. He murdered him at Madison Square Garden, slamming his face onto thumbtacks. He threw him through the cell. Mick Foley had to transform from mankind into Cactus Jack just to get into mental shape to fight Triple H. I think that was, and Triple H will tell you, that's his finest match, the match with Cactus Jack at Madison Square Garden. That's what brought Mick Foley to the end, the first run of his career to an emotional goodbye at the end of No Way Out after Triple H defeated him at uh, the Hell in a Cell. And that was a long, long story of Triple H firing Mick Foley and, tri- and Mick Foley having to come back and fighting against the McMahon Helmsley era. Oh, this is not a full debate, but I will give you the same amount of time. 
Go ahead. Go Undertaker ahead. and Mick Foley were at the height of when WWE gimmicks were where they needed to be. You had the Undertaker who was literally a destroyer. You know, they were booking him as a monster, a demon who was crucifying people. Uh, and then he's going toe to toe with a deranged one, a guy living in boiler rooms who was known for self-inflicting pain upon himself. That was the only viable competitor to go toe-to-toe to, toe to toe with the Phenom at that point. Anybody else wouldn't have been able to stand a chance with him. Mick Foley held his own because of his story, uh, his character, and his tortured past. And then how did that feud end? It, it ended at Hell in a Cell, where the two literally beat each other nearly to death, where it took the biggest bumps in WWE history to end that sort of feud. So I always have a problem. While I, I do love that Hell in a Cell, Nick has come out and said, like, it wasn't really a buildup as to why they'd be in Hell in a Cell. It was like, okay, they hate each other. It's just natural going to Hell in a Cell. But it, it wasn't that kind of... It didn't evoke the same argument as to why tri uh, Triple H and Cactus went to Hell in a Cell. And it, it's, it's, it's a catch-22 because they're both great arguments and you both put me in these effing compromising positions. <laughs> but if I'm getting to the heart of the answer, Guardino, you got it. Four tokens. Four. Four. So I knock out two. And you give them two. And I give them two. Okay, you gave me two. I'm not even playing. <laughs> he gives, he gives, he gives, me, he gives me two, and then he gives him. Okay, so where are your two? You keeping them right in front of you? I got rid of mine. No, no, you get no, two you, more. It's worth four. It's oh, four. okay, I got you. So I take away your. Two I'm wondering why so many are coming back to me. Here. <laughs> okay, they just eliminated you. I know. I mean, no one's hosting now. It's just chaos. All right, gents. Your next category. The category of nicknames. I'll give you the nickname, you give me the wrestler. Number one, the villain. Marty Scroll. Right, what do you want to do? Get a save back? Uh, I'll take a save. Okay. Number two, the enforcer. Arn Anderson. Correct. By the way, you don't lose these, they're there forever, but you can take another save. Number three, the ninth wonder of the world. China. What do you want to do? You want to max out at saves? Okay. Number four, Captain Charisma. Christian for the game. He's right. That's the game? He triggered the one oh. rule that wins the game. He won the entire trivia round. <laughs> we had a battle where Guardino took you to the brim and you just came back and fired. And now Steve Reskin's headlining Melee Mania. Congratulations!